Hello, I'm Peter Whittle of the New Culture Forum. At the beginning of this year, you might remember, I did an interview with the artist Jonathan Mars Lee. It proved very popular and struck a chord with thousands of viewers. Well, it's with great sadness that I wanted to tell you that Jonathan died last week after a long illness. He was 52. The loss of Jonathan will leave a huge void in the lives of his many friends and indeed the thousands of admirers who followed him on social media. His work as an artist of Britain's great country houses and gardens, alongside his portraiture and abstract work, will of course live on as a lasting tribute. But Jonathan the man, passionate, expansive, funny, charismatic, is irreplaceable. Despite the cancer that slowly spread, Jonathan seemed indestructible. He was sustained not just by his strong faith, but also by a remarkable spirit, optimism and a desire to share those things which he valued most, truth and beauty. He was that rare thing, somebody who enhances the lives of others. Jonathan loved the unique glories of Western civilization. He loved Britain. Like so many of us, the relentless attack on our culture and history caused him great pain and sadness. But far from retreating, he instead made sure to share those ideas, those works of art and architecture, those passions, with as many people as possible to ensure that they might survive. He was, for me, one of life's allies. He was a staunch supporter of the New Culture Forum and a source of endless encouragement. So I thought it would be fitting that we show here again the interview we did with him this year. If it's new to you, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, you of all people will know that on this programme we speak to a lot of academics, we speak to comedians, we speak to authors, even we can suffer the occasional politician. Uh, what we don't really speak to very much are people involved in the arts. So I'm delighted that today we have one of Britain's most successful artists joining us from Bath, Jonathan Miles Lee has made an extraordinary career from painting some of Britain's historic country houses and gardens. He also paints abstracts and portraits. His clients have gone from Oprah Winfrey through to the Prince of Wales. Now, at a time when our heritage is very much under attack, it's very good to hear someone uh, and speak to somebody from the arts who actually cares about it. Um, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Um, I wanted to sort of start by asking you, as an artist, you know, practically speaking, how does it work for you during lockdown? I mean, you, do you still work? Do you still work? Well, uh, yeah, of course, I'm working flat out. The only thing I miss is the gym because I love going swimming. But and I'm quite a hermit anyway, and I can work for oh, eight months to a year on a painting. So um, I'm quite used to spending really prolonged periods of time on my own. A big difference I've noticed is that my friends are phoning me a lot more because they're at home and, you know, they're wondering, you know, what, what they should do when they're not watching Netflix. <laughs> um, I, I want to start really by put, actually putting you in the deep end a bit, actually, uh, uh, immediately. Uh, you have done these wonderful paintings of Britain's historic country houses and the gardens and, and ground surrounding them. But, of course, country houses have sort of been drawn into what I would call a cultural onslaught this year. And I wonder what your feeling was about that, because we're hearing about the National Trust uh, basically now re-evaluating the histories of their country houses. How do you feel about that? Oh, outraged. No, I mean, I have the same feeling that most people would have who've been committed members of the National Trust for, you know, the last 30 years or so. Um, and unfortunately, most of the people I speak to are so upset about the new developments that they've 
given up their membership, so they must be losing a lot of income. And it's really tragic. It's, I suppose it came about as a measure to try and encourage more people to visit the properties. But there are a couple of experiences I had which, which made me feel a bit alienated from, from the National Trust. I think Hanbury Hall in Worcestershire had an exhibition of uh, feminist, um, there seemed to be placards everywhere displayed around the, the building with feminist quotes. And all of the sort of Tweedy um, uh, National Trust, the, norm, the normal visitors, were being sort of jostled out of place by these quite hefty girls with blue hair and big cameras and Doc Martens who wanted to photograph these uh, statements, these feminist statements, and put them on their Instagram accounts. So it changed the atmosphere. In, I mean, obviously, they're, they're trying to broaden the appeal, but it made the experience entirely different. I think a lot of people go to a National Trust property to, in order to slip back into the past. And the purpose, the remit of the National Trust was to preserve and protect Britain's heritage for, you know, in continuity. Another experience was at um, Hardwick Hall in Derbyshire, where I think we talked about this privately. I went in for the first time. It never seemed to be open whenever I went to Hardwick Hall. I wanted to see the long gallery with the great sort of, uh, you know, the vistas and great old portrait paintings hung on tapestry. And half of the paintings had been removed uh, and replaced by uh, um, all, all women, sort of strident feminists and television pre presenters, amongst them being Kathy oh. Newman. Well, this was like, set, yeah, <laughs> this was like setting off a firework for me because it was very shortly after the Jordan Peterson interview in which she'd used all of these appalling techniques and just fell flat on her face you know, by saying, so what you're saying is totally misre misrepresenting Jordan Peterson. And I think that's what gave the name for your interview Excuse. series. So what you're saying is. So um, I left Hardwick Hall without having my sort of uh, basil and tomato soup and a lovely relaxing cup of tea. Um, and I went red in the face. I think I just sort of strode back to the car and, and fled. So uh, I think they need to do a big rethink. I think as well, uh, much coming up to date, uh, Jonathan, uh, last week, it was in the, reported in the press that apparently uh, younger people are going to be, uh, as it were, sort of lecturing people at the National Trust on our colonial past. I mean, this, this is pure kind of Maoism, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Well, we are in the middle of a cultural revolution. It's a culture war. It's heating up and the, and the people are picking their sides. They've already picked their sides. Um, and I think we've, we've talked about, you know, where does all this come from? And I was thinking about this the other day uh, because we know all about the long march the, uh, through the institutions that Mark Sidwell, Sidwell has written that wonderful book about. Um, but I, I think we'll both remember occasions, say 20 years ago, when you go and visit your friends at Christmas or Easter and you'd be having a nice drink in the dining room or the sitting room and you'd ask their sons and daughters who'd become six foot in 10 minutes. So you're at university, what are you, what are you studying? And they'd say, oh, I'm doing uh, social justice and uh, public policy, or I'm doing uh, gender, race, sexuality and social dust justice. And you'd sort of go, goodness. <laughs> and you'd sort of move on and, and you'd never really question what on earth was that that they're yeah. studying. But now we know they weren't really studying anything at all apart from uh, identity politics and they were being drummed with this sort of Marxist, heavy Marxism, uh, no matter what uh, background they came from, they left university with these very militant ideas that all hierarchies are a result of the patriarchy and that uh, being white and male was the worst thing you could be. And then those people left university and of course they had no skills in anything apart from making a nightmare of themselves to other people. So they couldn't get jobs in anything particularly interesting apart from the HR departments. So there they were stuck in their uh, offices thinking, oh, how can I use my social justice and my, my identity politics here every single day being progressive and active. So what they did is started you know, attacking the organizations themselves they work for and the people who use those institutions and organizations. And now, unfortunately, they're the gatekeepers of the organizations. And I just wanted to add something here. I remembered uh, very recently that a friend of mine sent me an application to uh, be a, an advisor to the Arts Council about two years ago. And I thought, oh, that sounds fantastic. And then I read the in 
the information, the unpaid role. Well, it's fine, I still do that. Um, and then uh, I got to the bottom of the form. I'd filled everything out, and I thought, this is fantastic. I'd love to have my voice heard in the Arts Council. And right at the bottom, it said, uh, now, in your own words, write an essay about your personal commitment throughout your career to diversity and inclusion and uh, equality. And at that point, I just thought, oh, God, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I spoke to the friend who sent me the application for. He said, no, 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 just do it. But this is how the, the, the gatekeepers only make sure that, you know, the, the like-minded people um, enter the organisation. I mean, uh, the, obviously, that's an extremely familiar scenario that, you know, you're recounting there. But are you still, nevertheless, Jonathan, surprised at the speed with which the institutions capitulated over the past year? Yes. Yeah, it was odd, wasn't it, that they all capitulated. And what really upset me after the, the BLM squares was the, all of the, uh, the museums and the galleries that I love, even the one here in Bath, who've uh, blocked me from their Instagram, <laughs> um, started parroting the, the same phrases. And I thought how extraordinary it was that they didn't just go on the BLM web website to see that they wanted to do, you know, destroy the nuclear family, get rid of the police and overthrow capitalism. Um, why don't people Google more or Bing more? Perhaps they should Bing more. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what that was, what that's part of. Whether they're judging the general mood of the population, thinking, oh, we, we better go that direction. Um, or whether there are these, this, this group has been activated amongst the institutions through the Twitterati to say, you know, you need to get on board with this, otherwise we're going to deplatform you, we're going to blacken your name, we're going to picket your museums. Some, something's obviously going on because the speed with which it happened were, was, it was pretty terrifying actually. I think it's almost, a, you know, to, to carry the country house metaphor a bit, it's a bit like if, if you know, Death Wash Beetle has been in a place for long enough and then bang, it suddenly collapses, you know? It's a virus, isn't it? I forget who it was that I was watching online who, who explained the whole, uh, the, the, you know, the infestation um, of identity politics. It's, it's an anti-cultural, anti-art, um, anti-beauty movement, which is infesting the, the, the host body and corroding it from within. And it takes very strong personalities and strong voices, of which there are fewer and fewer because they're all being eradicated from their jobs and from, even from social media. They're being censored from social media. But those are the people who need to hold things together. I worked with the National Trust many, many years ago, making maps of places like Stowe Landscape Gardens and Cliveden and uh, oh, there was a number of places, but meticulous maps. And I was commissioned by a man called Gervais Jackson mm -hmm. Stops who was the chief advisor to the National Trust. And he was very erudite, wrote beautiful books on country houses and gardens, uh, sadly passed away you know, when he was relatively young. But he said, when you, when you design this map for us, I don't want it to look like it was designed by the Ministry of Agriculture. I want it to have some style. I want it to have an essence of the period. So I included in the map, which I, I did in, a, an engine, in an engraving style with meticulous, tiny little dots, as though it was done as, as an engraving. People in period costume, uh, walking up the hills, meeting friends, um, walking dogs with tricorn hats and big hooped dresses. And, um, you know, I tried to create the atmosphere of the period, which I think was more what the National Trust was trying to do back then. They were, they were giving you a very special experience, rather like a period movie, I suppose. Whereas now, as we've discussed many times, politics is rammed into every aspect of your life. You can't escape it. Whether you're buying shoes or going to uh, a restaurant, you know, there has to be something there plastered in front of you, forcing you to contemplate, um, you know, feminism or trans transgenderism, whatever. All great issues, but not when you're, you know, not every moment of the day. Actually, that's, uh, you mentioned restaurants there. Uh... Uh, Jonathan, uh, there's one particular issue as well, we talked about the National Trust, but there's one particular issue as well in London, and that's uh, to do with the Tate Britain, used to be the Tate Gallery, you know, now Tate Britain, has this very famous mural by a British artist, Rex Whistler. In fact, I think you've been called the success, natural successor to, to Rex Whistler, but it's a, it's a very famous mural, kind of fantastical, and it's, it goes all the way around the restaurant. Now, there are various images in that 
which have caused offence, which are of, of their time. But I think, isn't it right that there is now a real doubt over this very famous iconic piece of work as to whether it will actually survive? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that just shows the sort of period, the bizarre clown word world period we're living in, that a mural by Rex Whistler can be regarded as unequivocally offensive, which is what the chair of their ethics committee at the Tate said, unequivocally offensive. Well, it's, it's an amazing piece of artwork for somebody who was 21 when he executed it. He was paid five pounds a day. I mean, imagine the excitement it must have been to get a commission like that. Um, and um, they've spent a great deal of money restoring it. It's a stunning thing. I loved it so much and it sort of fitted my, my aesthetic that I had my 40th birthday party in, in, in that room. You can, you can rent it out. But um, they said that the, the offence is compounded by the fact that it's used as a restaurant. So, you know, the fact that there's a very, there's a tiny, uh, I think there's a child, a black child chained and you have to look very hard to find it. So whoever has been in that room with a, you know, a bubbling up with resentment and, and rage towards the bourgeoisie has spent a long time looking for something to be annoyed about in that room. And you have to look pretty hard. So, um, I mean, there's been a lot of media attention about it. I think, it's, I think the media get on board because they're using their platform to kind of punish us, punish the middle class for, for you know, not editing our heritage significantly enough to eradicate all images of barbarity in Britain's dreadful past. Um, and so th these are the walls that we have to pass through. You know, these uh, very militant journalists and um, people in the HR departments and the curators of museums who are really putting impediments to our enjoyment of everything by, again, politicizing everything. Don't you think that, you know, it will be a huge, a massive and long project to somehow turn around what appears to be a cult of self-loathing? Yes. Well, Roger Scruton talked about this, I think, even in your interview about the, the uh, what did His he call it? The culture repudiation, uh, I think. That's it, the culture repudiation, which is very, very sad. I mean, um, I don't have any children, but I work and stay with a lot of my clients over a period of time. And even in, you know, quite affluent families, you'll find that the children have adopted this very radical politics from their schools or later when they go to university. So you'll hear something at the breakfast table um, or at the Christmas table. Oh, goodness, there's no cranberry sauce, the father will say. And the son will say, oh, that's a very that's a very first world problem. And it's a little indication of what sort of where what the angle of their education is. And lying behind that will be, you know, the fact that some cities are too white or, um, you know, the university is not diverse enough or something like this. Um, I was trying to remember what you asked me just before that. Yes, no, basically, uh, I think this problem of self-loathing, uh, that basically this is going oh, yeah. to take a long time. Yeah, no, the culture of it's been going there. For, it's been going for a long, long time. And um, it, again, it's corrosive. And it, there's so much energy and time wasted on this energy of, of destruction that very little is being produced. I can't think of any truly great classical composers or even pop uh, music or writers of great note. I mean, I like Robert Harris, his trilogy of uh, Cicero and his book about Pompeii, but there, there, there doesn't seem to be a very um, vivacious culture at the moment. No. And uh, in my more depressed moments, I've said culture is dead, R.I.P. culture, you know, because it, it looks so bleak. All the things that we, that we used to feel so excited about um, are now being replaced, if you look at the media, by um, identity politics. And uh, it, it, for instance, if you, if you watch an, a sports report now, it's never about sport, it's about racism in mm. sport or if you, and you very rarely hear, hear anything on the media about an or orchestra unless someone's been unfairly dismissed because of, of some sort of sexist comment. So um, all of this noise is crowding out what should really be in its place, which is creativity and, um, you know, development and, um, well, creativity really. I think it's stymied creativity because if you fear, feel fearful, which most people do in their places of work, you can't think creatively, can you? You're just 
you're just completely paralyzed. And when I speak to people about politics, I'm lucky, I'm like the sort of court jester or, you know, I, as an artist, you, you're able to get away with a lot more, saying a lot more. But when I try to talk to friends about political issues, they actually become quite stiff yes. and terrified yes. and they don't know what to say. Yes. There is something I wanted to say about the civil service as, as well. I have a friend who works for the cabinet office and it took him about six months to reveal what he actually does because I think they have to sign um, you know, non-disclosure agreements. Um, I still don't really know what he does but one day I went to meet him for lunch in Westminster and the, the rain was coming down so heavily I said well don't you have a canteen in, in, in the building um, it was the foreign office it's very, very near the Churchill st statue and he, he wasn't very pleased about the idea of going in but I sort of insisted and we went through the doors and I immediately the th first thing I noticed was everybody was extremely young and it's not just because you know I'm, I'm over 50 now but everybody's very young it's very diverse not the sort of diversity you'd see in England or in Britain as a whole, more of a London type of diversity. Um, lots of women, lots of blue hair. Um, we went to the canteen and I commented upon this. I said, do you find that there's quite a lot of uh, militant feminists uh, working in the civil service? And my friend went bolt yeah. upright and said, we at the civil service are committed to equality and diversity as though he'd become a member of a cult. Yeah. It was quite strange. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether he thought cameras were watching him while he said it. And, and I said, oh, goodness, um, I didn't know what to say. And he said, and anyway, the worst thing that could happen is that for the civil service to be full of middle class white men. Yeah. And I said, I think you're a racist. <laughs> and I'm afraid after lunch I left and we've never spoken again, but we've been friends for 20 years. He started out at the Royal Academy. That actually sounds, you know, more and more familiar, I think, for more and more people. Um, that kind of story. You mentioned a, a while back there, uh, Roger Scruton. Um, I, just something else he said and has talked about and indeed done programs about, and that is how we have abandoned the whole idea of beauty now. Um, and in fact, there's an idea that somehow ugliness uh, holds within it truth, and it's no longer beauty and truth. Uh, would you agree with that? Oh, totally. Well, you know that Roger Scruton's work has had a massive impact upon him, not upon me. And, and he was very kind. I wanted to use some quotes from his uh, lectures in a lecture I gave at Harvard Business School a couple of years ago. And he very kindly said, oh, I'll look through your lecture if you like. Um, so I had planned to go and spend a few days with him in, uh, at his house in, in, in Gloucestershire. But unfortunately, he passed away um, this time last mm -hmm. year. But um, the thing that most people associate with Roger is that TV broadcast where, uh, called the, the, the Power of Beauty, um, we, in which he opened by saying, um, if you'd asked anybody between 1730 and, uh, 1750 and 1930, what was the purpose of art, literature, music, they would have said beauty. Yeah. And when you ask them what was the purpose of beauty, they would say it was a value like goodness and truth. And I, that's something we've certainly lost a sense of in, um, in contemporary society. Um, it is true that up until, I think up until about 1920s, when people wrote more letters, the, 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 the education system was based more on a classical model. And that's through the classic, our classical heritage, we get a sense that beauty is somehow related to the divine or the sacred. Um, and that's increasingly being trashed. And what's become fashionable is, uh, you know, looking at ugly art, ugly buildings, physically making yourself ugly uh, through various means, piercings and tattoos. Shouldn't really say that. Lots of people got tattoos. But um, there does seem to be this cult, a slide towards uh, repudiation, repudiation of the past, repudiation of things that are beautiful. I went to Rome on a trip with a good friend of mine from university and he brought a friend who was an academic from um, um, a university in the north of Ireland and she was a militant atheist and um, she also didn't like the patriarchal imagery of Rome. So you can imagine she wasn't having a very good time, she didn't want to go any, into any churches, she hated all the sculptures of the Caesars and I said but can't you appreciate that this is really beautiful, you know, these things are beautiful. And her response was, beauty is fascist. No, no. Yes. 
And it's one of those yellow highlighter moments for me. When she said it, it was almost as though her words were lit up on a screen in front of me. Beauty is fascist. And um, I've never forgotten it. It must have been about 10 years ago. And I thought, my gosh, there are some people who are really far gone. Yes. They really, really do associate uh, beauty, uh, you know, beautiful landscapes, anything. I suppose their, their appreciation of so much in the world is, is marred by this indoctrination that they, I, I guess they've picked up from university. It's not a natural thing to feel like no. that. One's natural way of, of evolving as a human being is to feel in harmony with one's environment, especially the natural environment. I come from a long line of farmers and I went walking in the Lake District uh, you know, almost every weekend as a child. N nobody really explained to me that it was beautiful. They didn't say, uh, try and interpret this landscape and, uh, and uh, perceive it as beautiful. It, it was just obvious that it was. You have a bond with it, a natural bond, as, as Roger Scruton says. When that happens, you feel at home. You have a sense of peace. You don't run around at, with an angry expression trying to break everything apart. So, and that's one of the reasons I moved to Bath, because it, it's a beautiful place, a UNESCO site. It's one of the most Italianate cities in Britain. And you do feel at home, even if it's locked down, there are no people on the streets. The buildings themselves feel like your friends. They have familiar, yes. familiar shapes and proportions. It, 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 it's a beautiful, beautiful way of putting it, actually. Uh, you talk there about feeling part of the land and things are rising organically from that land. Um, another thing I would say, that one of the qualities about your work and particularly your country house, house work and gardens, um, really, Jonathan, is that they do have this very English quality about them. Um, and I, I think I read somewhere that you, you listen to some of the great English composers uh, when you're working, such as Elgar or Vaughan Williams or Gerald Finzi, which, uh, again, I love all of those. Um, what would you say is the essence of Englishness? I think you've already kind of told us in a way with the landscape, but is there something else? I mean, how would you, how would you sum it up? Well, I'll tell you, but you have to agree to do six more podcasts or six, six more recordings, because this is something that we, we could yeah. talk about for a long time. Mm. But when anybody asks me about that, I usually refer them to a book by Roger Scruton, which I think is his masterpiece. It's called England yeah. and Elegy. England and Elegy. Don't be put off by the cover. The cover is very unattractive. It's got, it's sort of a block print of somebody playing cricket. But in that, it is a eulogy to all the things really that we're in the process of losing, which is tragic. But in the, in the process of uh, articulating what those things are, um, not just aesthetic, but sort of the English common law, um, it makes you fall in love with Britain again. It, it is an amazing book. And normally when I read a book, I underline a few lines. I think I underlined the entire book. So I'm going to reread it again uh, in the near future. But um, m my own feelings about what Britishness or what Englishness is, is very much connected to the landscape. I think more than many uh, European countries, Brit Brits think of the, uh, the White Cliffs at Dover, or they think of those sort of bucolic um, scenes in Yorkshire of the Dales, or they, th they think of the South Downs. And when I've lived overseas in Brussels or America, when I think of England, I don't think of wheelie bins and wet tarmac um, in London. I think, of, I think of these beautiful Arcadian landscapes. I think of the, the tarns and the fells in the Lake District. But also we have this incredible rich literary tradition. So of course, against the background of Elgar's music, you're hearing you know, poetry of, uh, of, of Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, we have s such an extraordinary culture which the rest of the world is, is so jealous of. And that's why it's so extraordinary that anybody here could be in any way negative about Britain. Um, in America, if you say, oh, I don't like living in Detroit, I don't like LA, somebody will very quickly say to you, well, go then, just go. Um, but in, in Britain, it seems to be uh, sort of quite accepted for people to sit around complaining about, uh, about the country. And um, I don't have any patience for that at all. My Instagram account is, is, does the same thing, I think, as um, Roger's books. It celebrates uh, the great traditions and the great people of, of Britain. And I was lucky when I was very young, I was brought up with a, an entire set of Arthur Mee's children's encyclopedias, which were published initially about 1908. I think mine were printed in the 20s. And um, they were set, set out in different sections and they would have great men, great scientists, great artists, 
uh, great engineers and so and you know great painters and so I, I felt as though as I grew up I wanted to be part of this group I wanted to be part of this club I, you know I chose art I wanted to be a great artist um, and that was part of being patriotic it was part of mm. your your way of um, you know working within the world and it, imp it Im implied that there was a civic duty behind which the career that you chose you didn't pick a career because it would make you the maximum amount of yeah. money it would be a way of you integrating into a fine tradition and then creating something new to pass on to the future when you think about these things when you think about the greatness that you read about as a child uh, and we look at what's happening now I know that it causes a lot of people who get in touch with us here a huge dismay. I mean, a, a real dismay. They feel it as being an attack on themselves. And, and I think in some ways they're right that that is actually the intention. But when it comes to, if you like, a, con a sort of political point of view, uh, you would think that conservatives would, you know, make sure to conserve and to protect that culture. But when we look at the current Conservative Party, it doesn't seem to be the case, does it? This is a bit of a bold thing to say, but I think a lot of people who go into politics, they're, you know, they're very protective of their lifestyle and reputation. And to, to be bold and tell, tell the truth about a, a major issue or to make a stand um, can threaten that. So it's, it's difficult. They're being pushed by the civil service and they're being squeezed by their PR consultants, I'm sure, a lot of the time. And I think, as you know, I was a big fan of Margaret Thatcher, even when people hated her in the 19, uh, you know, I, I was 10 when she came to power in 1979. So I think she was in power, was it nine yes. years? Uh, um, 11 years. And I used to include... 11 years. 11 years, was it? Yeah. So um, it was partly because I responded to her rhetoric. And of course, she looked fabulous. She was always immaculate. <laughs> she was very media savvy. But my mother had done a, a, an open university one year humanities course, I think, before she went on to Bath University, actually, and included in the material that was sent to her was a, a long playing disc, the, you know, the vinyl discs of uh, speeches from Shakespeare and also political speeches by uh, people like um, uh, Michael Foote, the previous leader of the Labour Party, Ben, uh, Richard Burton reading Shakespeare, King Lear. And so uh, I realized at that point the great power of rhetoric and the power of the word to move great numbers of people. And of course, that was, some, that was a classical tradition because when you studied the trivium, trivium and the quadrivium back, that ended in 1920, about 19, that was your education for 2000 years. You would basically start study the speeches of Cicero next year, the speeches and letters of Cicero. And Cicero isn't really a very well-known character today, uh, generally, but it basically you, your education would have been composed of uh, speeches, so it taught you how to express, how to think, basically. Margaret Thatcher was aware of that, and she was asked in an in, in interview, you know, how important do you think the classical, classical education is in education? She said, it is everything, because a classical education tell, teaches you how to be and how to think and how to express your ideas. And um, so I think I'm, on some level I responded to that in Margaret Thatcher because I found her, she was a, a real um, conviction politician, wasn't yes, she? Indeed. And, yes, indeed. And incredible, um, incredibly quotable. I remember her battles with Jacques Delors and, uh, and her sort of standing at the dis dispatch box saying, no, no, no. You know, it, she was a formidable force, especially as she was one woman in this sea of men who were all wearing black suits at the time. It's very different from today. But I thought, those are my role models, people who can speak their truth, even when they know they're going to be hated for it. I think that's the definition. You've got to care um, about your reputation and your position in society, but not so much that it hampers your ability to tell the truth. So that's why I, I suppose I'm relatively outspoken. As I've mentioned before, I have this Instagram account and my father used to follow me and he would every morning phone me and say, you can't say that or remove this picture of Margaret Thatcher. I said, look, if people respect me, they'll still follow me. And the, view, and the, the numbers of people following me have just risen and risen and risen. I think it's something like 25,000 25, at the moment. Yeah, 25,000. Yeah. Um, and then um, 
if I go for a little walk in the park here during lockdown, I feel as though I'm providing a service because a lot of people are in apartments or locked up in cities. So I just go for a walk in the park and talk about the, uh, the different types of trees and the inflorescences on the uh, horse chestnuts in the spring. And I'll bring in a little story about uh, Jane Austen or something like that. And three or 4,000 people will watch them. Just a five minute sort of discursive little trip. So that's why I decided to start up this thing called Miles Lee TV, which I haven't designed the website yet, but I just bought the domain name so I can start making more videos and talking, talking discursively about arts, culture, but within a context of, you know, using the things around me, the buildings and the trees in order to talk about nature and, and how much impact it should have on our lives. Sounds like a, an incredibly worthwhile project. I think, uh, you know, to on this English point as well, sorry to go back a bit, uh, Johnson. Um, you know, I think uh, this is e extremely important because, you know, for example, recently there was a, a BBC presenter for Countryfile, I think, uh, who started talking about the inherent racism of British gardening culture. Now, I mean, you have painted some of the most brilliant, wonderful gardens. And I think you're, you are actually a bit of a gardener yourself, aren't you? Well, I was, um, I don't, I'm living in the, in the Royal Crescent in Bath, right. which doesn't have a garden. It just has a, a big lawn in front of it with nothing, right. no, nothing growing apart from a Christmas tree for a few weeks in the, in the winter. But um, I did live at Roy Strong's uh, Laskett Gardens in Herefordshire for a while. And he gave me a little part of the garden to look after. And I thought, well, that's not too much. That's fine. It's just a bit of topiary and some box hedging. Well, it was almost like a full-time job. So it made me decide never to have a garden, to be honest. Trimming the medlar tunnel and dragging away all the sticky, sticky medlars as they rotted, as they bletted was, was a, you know, it meant that I didn't get any painting done. But um, so, yeah, going back to the point about gardening being politicized, um, that's just a symptom of a wider problem. Mm. Everything's being politicized. Every aspect mm. of our life is now politicized. There's no yeah. point of even listing them because it's, it includes everything. Every, every time you open your mouth, it's being politicized. Mm. Every word is being politicized, like the use of our men and our, our women, that stu stupid statement made in the Congress. Um, so uh, I think the only sensible to reaction, reaction to it is to sort of completely ignore all of it. Why do we yeah. play along with it? I'm always confused. Why do people say, uh, oh, you shouldn't really say that? Um, and then the response is, of course, that words are violence. Well, I'm like you. I was brought up in a period when we were told as children that sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Yes. So um, yeah. I always make this strange analogy, peanuts and, um, and snowflakes. So if you are so careful about your children, so precious with your children, you don't ever expose them to peanuts because they might have an allergy. Uh, the allergy rates go up, don't they? Yes. Um, and uh, that's what's happened. So we have lots of people who, who, who are very careful with their children. They can't give them, and no nuts. They'll have, a, they'll have a terrible nervous shock or something like this. And it's the same with ideas. Um, and um, if you shelter people from complicated or uh, really distressing ideas, you end up with people who, the snowflake generation, and uh, safe spaces in schools and universities. And the reason I find that particularly weird and anomalous is because when I was at university, I was very lucky. I became a member of the Colony Room, which is a, an old drinking club in Soho. It started in the 1950s by a woman called Muriel Belcher, which I thought was a yes. great name for somebody who sold booze. Um, <laughs> and uh, she, the tradition was that you, she used to hand it on the ownership to a barman. So she handed it on to a man called Ian Board, who ran it for many years. And I was taken there by my boss, the boss from Channel 4, Ken Thompson, um, on a night. Because you worked in television, didn't you? You yeah, were working in television. Yes. I did, because I was a, disaffected. I was disappointed with my history of art degree. It was full of commies. Yeah. Um, and I think, actually, they were, they were um, activated to be more uh, strident in their views, because main, they were mainly privately educated uh, people on the course. And they really, they really didn't like that. They, they had a real issue with the fact that most of the girls quite liked Impressionism, really. Um, anyway, so I was, I was disaffected with the university education and I went to get a job, job at Channel 4. Amazingly, they created a job for me. Worked in the press office and then as a continuity announcer in the presentation department. My boss took me to an exhibition of photography in Dean Street. 
uh, in Soho and then afterwards we went to the colony room and in in the room was George Melly this uh, very vibrant uh, yep. jazz singer um, there was Maggie Hamling who's an incredible portrait painter and right in the middle, middle of the room was Francis Bacon looking quite narrow I remember in a, in a leather jacket and my boss pushed me into the room I was dressed all in white I was 20 years old the uh, youngest person in the room he pushed me towards Francis Bacon past the barman the owner Ian Board and said this is Jonathan he's a Christian and the whole place <laughs> erupted and Ian Board said, oh no, get him out of here. We don't want a Christian in here, get him out. Francis Bacon gallantly leant forward and put his hand on my forearm and said, oh no, I think it's fascinating if anybody believes in anything, come over here. So he took me to a window seat and, and questioned me about my background and uh, asked me about what I was doing. I was at university. Luckily, George Melly was sitting very nearby and I'd painted his portrait about three years before and George Melly said actually he's a very good painter. Francis took note and said well you must bring some paintings of yours to show me sometime which I thought was extraordinary and I yes. did that in Rees Mews. Of course I went back to my lecturers at uh, London University full of excitement enthusiasm I thought well they'll like this because he's you know he's a famous modern painter and I told them that I'd spent an evening at Lescargo getting totally drunk with with Francis Bacon and they were absolutely deadpan they were kind of disgusted and it took me years to realize that they were just jealous they were yes. resentful about everything I thought what, what a wonderful opportunity this would have been I could have given a little talk at, at university about my experiences I saw Francis Bacon paint I woke up on several occasions on the floor after quite a heavy night in Soho and would see him painting I'd first hear the scratching on the canvas and on one occasion I saw him picking up a postcard of one of his paintings and he seemed to be copying it and I said oh what what are you doing Francis and he said oh it's the bloody Marlborough they want everything to look the same this was in the late <laughs> 1980s and so he was trying to you know bend to their will and create things which all had a similarity but this is something I've never talked about on on film before that there was something in Francis Bacon go beyond all of that really really um, terrifying imagery which was yearning for a connection with the divine with mm. with something mm. greater mm. Mm. even though in interviews he would deny that absolutely no there's nothing this is all we are because he'd lived through two world wars I think he was 10 when the first one finished in his 30s when the second world war took place and it had really damaged him as a person and his relationship with his father but he later said when he saw me in the colony room all dressed in white and being presented as a Christian <laughs> in the colony room of all places which was a den of iniquity um, he was he was kind of fascinated he wondered why it was yes. happening and yes. in fact we went on to have conversations about art about Velasquez I remember we went through many many pages of books by Velasquez and he was somebody who was fascinated by pigment and paint and he yearned to be able to paint like Velasquez and he said I could never do it I could never do it but he'd look at my meticulous little watercolors sometimes of portraits he said now you can really do it you can really do it mm. he said you must leave Channel 4 you must leave London forget about all these people that are all soaks you don't want to end up like them all alcoholics like us um, leave London <laughs> become an artist um, otherwise you'll never be happy so the, on the only real art tuition I've ever had um, and advice career advice for art has come from Francis Bacon and if it wasn't for him <laughs> saying that I wouldn't have become a professional painter but I think there's probably well, almost nobody else who could actually claim that the their, their, their one, uh, you know, sort of uh, mentor was in fact Francis Bacon. I, I think Francis Bacon is a very good, for the reasons you've just said, is that on the, on the surface they appear to be spectacularly ugly, but at the same time actually there is, well, what I can only say, you feel there's something great there. I mean, I feel, I can't quite define it, but it, it's sort of great. Um, what I want to ask you a little bit about, actually, uh, John says you spent some time in America too. You were in Los Angeles and New York, and um, I mean, did you sort of you were painting there? Uh, you know, did you embrace that kind of aesthetic too? It, you know, in it, which is a very I've lived in LA too. It's a very particular form of aesthetic, isn't it? We've got David Hockney uh, who celebrated it, but I mean, did you embrace that? It's very un-English. Eventually, it? eventually, I did. I mean, I'm very curious. I love travel. 
But the first, the reason I went to New York was um, actually because Oprah Winfrey invited me to do a painting of our estate in Montecito, uh, Santa Barbara. And I yeah. had to wait for six months before starting work on it. So I went to stay with a friend in, in New York and he worked with one of the Estee Lauder companies. So pretty quickly, because I painted his portrait and his boss's portrait, Evelyn Lauder, who started Clinique, the Clinique brand, asked me to paint her portrait, which I did three times. So I was actually continuing with um, the European tradition. And of course, in New York, um, they, they, well, at least in the, whenever I was there, 2003, four, they were still fascinated by the European tradition. And I painted houses in Westchester and upstate New York and did a few more portraits. Um, so really, when I was in New York, I was still doing things which were very European based. Um, a few years later, I moved to Los Angeles because uh, the Lauder family inherited these portraits I'd done of Evelyn and said, would you paint the rest of the family? Which was very exciting because Leonard Lauder, Lauder owned a huge collection of uh, Cubist paintings. Uh, the family had set up the Neu Gallery on Fifth Avenue. I thought this is a great opportunity. So I applied for my O1 visa and, and got it very easily. In fact, this, the, the immigration attorney uh, in California said, if you don't get it, I'll write into the contract that if you don't get it, I'll give you your money back. And I said, why is that? She said, well, I put the Wikipedia page for the Queen in your application. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I painted the Queen in 1997. So, true to form, I think I got it in about a month and I moved to Hollywood and um, I, I, I worked on this painting of a group of four members of the, the Lauder family and delivered it to their place near San Francisco. Um, and then started painting Colcord homes, which are sort of what we would call the arts and crafts style homes in, in Hollywood from the 1930s. So yeah. I, I found that there was a good seam of work there. I also painted houses back in Britain and then ex exported them. Um, that was a bit dicey sometimes, you know, creating them up, sending them, sending something I'd spent six months working on, eight months back to England, but it was fine. And then um, I started ex expanding a little bit because LACMA has a collection of uh, very good American abstract paintings. And when you're in that context, as you know, because you've lived there, bright sunlight, uh, you know, action paintings seem quite exciting and sexy. So I started experimenting by painting outside. It's very hot in the summer in LA. And I would just use um, big sort of sometimes 12 inch brushes and I'd just let the paint splash on. So that's why I don't dismiss um, contemporary abstract painting completely. I'm not, I'm not somebody who falls on one or one side or the other, although I lean more yeah. towards traditional paintings. And, and I was selling them through a company called Fendi Casa, the in interiors company in Beverly Hills, um, for the same price as their sofa, about 30,000. So they, they, they really were of a place and of a time. And I think that's the case with most art, isn't it? Um, yes. Our British art, our pictures of English country houses, um, have a resonance in this country. Um, and they're sort of emiss emissaries when they go abroad. The Huntington mm. Museum in, uh, in California has a lot of Arthur Devis paintings, conversation pieces from the 18th century by an artist uh, who came from Preston in Lancashire or Gainsborough's. Um, but these mm. paintings are emissaries uh, in the same way that um, the abstract expressionist paintings do the same thing when they come to England and um, yeah, form yeah. big exhibitions. Yeah. With your connection to America but, uh, and, and obviously here, uh, what is your feeling, Jonathan, about the future of, if you like, our culture? I, when I say our culture, I, I, I mean specifically from a kind of artistic heritage point of view, because otherwise it's too big. But it, it seems, you know, when you look at what's been happening over the past, well, actually very, very intensely over the past year, but as you said, going on for a long time, are you, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I'm actually optimistic. I'm, I'm wired that way. Um, but also I have quite a strong faith. So I, that gives you a sense of, um, peace and uh, an ability not to react emotionally to everything that you see. If you did, if you, if you like a lot of my rel relatives, are glued to the TV screen, if you let the media determine your state of mind, you'll be mad within a week. Mm. And I think that yes. uh, certainly over the last year, as you said, during lockdown, um, it's taken a lot of people into, um, uh, into a part of their personalities which is unreachable, and that's tragic. Yeah. 
and it's damaged the very old and the very young worst I think um, and like you I've observed this incredible polarization which is taking place and um, you know it seemed as though we would never be able to breach that that uh, that that chasm um, but I think people are starting to realize now that if this carries on they'll literally be at each other's throats and um, I was thinking about this the other day about some sort of reconciliation it came out of a personal experience I'd had I've been attacked by just only two or three people through Instagram for the last few months and they would attack me on cultural issues political issues whatever anything they could find against me um, but I decided to react to them in, not in the normal adv adversarial way I didn't want to correct them I didn't want to teach them I didn't want to abuse them although I was receiving all of that uh, from them I just bombarded them with love and compassion and I tried to find some find some shared ground so I'd go around the major issues and I'd talk to them about about holidays they may have enjoyed or whatever and within a few days just a few days after this years of abuse um, there was a really moving reconnection which actually was much stronger than if we'd never known each other because we'd shared these battles but we'd actually found some common ground so I think that that's what I'm going to try and put forward in this in these Milesley TV programs that we have to focus on the positive because if you continuously occupy your uh, your territory and you paint the opposition in a two-dimensional way and it dehumanizes them and it and it it doesn't take it, it takes you further and further away basically the divisions will only get bigger so I think it takes individuals like you like me to to pick a path of reconciliation uh, you're not going to find it on the mainstream media media and often you don't find it on the alternative media either because these people are siloed and they're really just attacking either side of a hill and uh, you know it's very rare to get a balanced view isn't it something which is uh, more nuanced and a bit more I think you have to be brave like uh, uh, Brett Weinstein I think he's very good the Dark Horse podcasts you know he's he um, he's able to um, bring left and right issues together in a very sophisticated way only thing I'd say to that though Jonathan to be devil's advocate for a minute is that that reconciliation you talk about that kind of reaching out it does always seem to have to come from for want of a better expression our side you know I mean the the level the level of hate that you get you know and I, I talk to someone who was involved in Brexit in the campaign going right back but on all these issues it does seem to have to come from us that doesn't mean to say that you don't have to do it um finally uh John just want to ask you know it's a, a bit of a cliche but given that there is the sense and the, in fact the reality that our art establishment are all pretty much monolithic in their views what would your advice be to an artist, young artist, who looked at your stuff and said, I want to paint like that and I want to do that and I want to make a success of it. What should they do? Well, first of all, don't paint like I do because it's so meticulous. You'll go blind by the time you're 40 um, and you'll never finish a picture for 12 months. You know, it's, it's so meticulous. Also, that's my, those are my paintings. Um, the, the other thing is uh, just ignore the art gallery system, ignore the agents. I've never sold a painting through an agent or a gallery. I've never had an exhibition. Um, just be yourself, and, but be a little bit canny as well. There's nothing wrong with being businesslike. Um, Rubens, the great uh, Netherlandish painter, he was a cultural uh, diplomat who came to visit Charles I walked into the banqueting house, looked up and saw the blank ceilings and said, mm, I think you could do with a whole series of uh, historical <laughs> pictures up there. Yeah. Went back, set up an enormous studio full of assistants and within yeah. you know, a couple of years they'd created them and installed them. So there's nothing wrong with entrepreneurialism at all. In no. fact, if you're going to be a successful artist, you need to be quite canny. You, t you need to know about accounting. You need to know about uh, how to behave amongst the sorts of clients that you want to cultivate. Um, I think having some business sense, being interested in psychology, in fact, being interested in absolutely everything except yourself. Yes. Stop thinking, stop believing mm. what your tutors are telling you at university, that you have to some, somehow vomit up your psychological damage into an object which is reassembled from bits of uh, shopping trolleys and that sort of no nonsense. The reason they're telling you that is because they perhaps can't draw, they don't really know how to create beautiful art. 
it takes five minutes to sell, tell somebody, you know, for this project, I think you should do something like gather some fruit and photograph it as it rots. You know, it takes five minutes to explain that, but it takes decades to teach somebody the techniques um, mm -hmm. and craft ability to create something which is lasting and really moved, moves people. But the main thing I think is, you know, don't forget about beauty because beauty is the thing that connects everybody. That's the, the true uh, diversity issue. You know, beauty is, is universal and eternal and focus on beauty, you know. What a, what a way to end it. Uh, thank you very, very much, John, for that. I just want to say, obviously, what we will do is in underneath uh, the interview, we will put a link to your website so people can look at the, your stuff. But I want to thank you once again, you know, for, for joining us. And, uh, and maybe uh, next uh, or later in the year, you'll come back and talk to us again. I'd love to, because in fact, we could do seven of these interviews. And we yes. Could, we, could, we could cover so much ground, you know. We've only just touched the surface. But yeah. it's, it's, it's wonderful to meet you. And hopefully at some point we could be in the same room together. That would be really well. Well, you know, God willing. God willing. Okay. okay. Bless you. you soon. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, that's it for today on So What You're Saying Is. Uh, please don't forget, will you, to subscribe because uh, uh, over Christmas, in fact, uh, 5,000 of you actually subscribed. Thank you so much for that. It's very simple. You just go and put on the, uh, your finger on the subscribe button and then also on the notifications so you get notifications coming through. Uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.